you know, when someone who's five feet tall walks into a shelter and says, I'm Dr. Soske, and I am going to run this medical area to the National Guard, then um, the National Guard's either like, well, this lady is delusional or she (laughs) must really be in charge. (laughs) Thanks for tuning in to this episode of I Have Something to Say, where subject matter experts are unafraid and unapologetic about sharing their perspectives regarding issues that impact our lives. They speak up because basically they give a shit. So if you're tired of canned answers and want to finally hear real people cut through the BS and talk about real issues, this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Sami Heyman Marrero from Urbander, and behind our mixer is our producer, Chris Majoka from You Do You. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of I Have Something to Say. And we have a very special guest. I met Dr. Ashley Saucier in 2017 in a moment of crisis and desperation through Facebook. And uh, we just recently reconnected and it was like hugging an old friend virtually, right? Right, Ashley? (laughs) Absolutely. It's like... (laughs) It was like, I felt like in the background, we had the song, reunited and it feels so good, right? <laughs> because yes. we hadn't spoken in like two, three years. And oh my goodness, it was just such a joy uh, to have, um, you know, to be able to talk to you, you know, last week. And then now to be able to schedule um, this uh, conversation. So welcome, welcome to uh, our podcast Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this is great. I mean, Dr. Saucier, just to give a little bit of background, is a pediatric uh, emergency medicine uh, doctor, uh, but also much more than that. I mean, I think that, let me just back up a minute, right? We met immediately in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria uh, slamming Puerto Rico, And uh, Dr. Saucier was completely like immediately on action mode, right? And we found each other on Facebook just like maybe two, three days afterwards and then worked for, I want to say at least three, four months in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria because just by virtue of your experience dealing with hurricanes, right, impacting uh, communities and underserved communities on top of that, um, you just brought this uh, perspective from a medical um, angle, right? And the importance of really uh, intervening immediately with medications and all of these, um, uh, how do you say, yeah, health needs that right. can really exponentially, right, yeah, impact and make the crisis even worse. So just talk to me about, you know, how, how did you... Uh, you know, become such an advocate. And, you know, I know that you have also the Baton Rouge Emergency Aid Coalition. I mean, t- tell me about, you know, your trajectory and um, how you became a doctor and why you became a doctor of emergency <laughs> pediatric medicine, all of that good stuff, just to ground this conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, So I'm from uh, central Louisiana, small town, Marksville. And my uncle was a physician in family medicine. And so I grew up in his office. My mom worked with him. Um, and so I grew up in his office. So I always said that I was going to be a doctor. Um, I was pretty sure I would do pediatrics. How I ended up in pediatric emergency medicine is a story for another podcast. Um, but I'm so happy <laughs> that's that's where I ended up. Um, and I I think um, you know my, a boy mom and uh, I have like adult onset ADHD. So I think emergency medicine and disaster relief is you know it's it fits with me, with my personality. Um, And honestly, in 2016, Baton Rouge and the surrounding areas had the Baton Rouge flood. And so it just, um, it was August of that year and it started raining and it wasn't a hurricane. It just rained and rained and rained. And the rivers were already at pretty high levels and the water kept rising. Over a hundred thousand homes were flooded in the area in just a matter of days. Um, And, and we were watching people move 
from shelter to shelter. So they would go to one shelter, that shelter would flood, they would move to the next shelter. Um, and you know, when you, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you put your feet on the ground, you get out of bed, put your feet on the ground and there's a foot of water in your house, you're, you're just thinking about the vital things in your life. You're thinking about your family, you're thinking about your pets, you're grabbing and going, and you're not thinking about maybe your insulin or your blood pressure medicine or your medication for, for your mental well being. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we saw in the immediate aftermath of the flood. And, you know, the federal response, the DMAT teams stepped up and had shelters for those that were medically fragile. But there mm-hmm. was nothing set up for people who just needed to bridge my insurance card is flooded in my home and I need my meds for the next week or, you know, Mm -hmm. um, whatever the case may be. And uh, that's where the need was and no one was stepping up. And, you know, when someone who's five feet tall walks into a shelter and says, I'm Dr. Sosie and I am going to run this medical area to the national guard, then, um, the national guards either like, well, this lady is delusional or she must really be in charge. Um, yeah. and so that, that's what happened. Um, yeah. but within hours, we had so many volunteers. I mean, we had pharmacists, we had physicians, we had our own, um, HIP compliant medical record, like within hours. And so mm-hmm. We figured out how to do it. The federal response is, um, the federal and state responses are decent, but they, there's so much red tape. And so the response time is really lagging behind the needs time, right? What people Mm -hmm. need. Um, And we found that the private sector could step in and really um, take a foothold. And, you know, our... Um, you mentioned Baton Rouge Emergency Aid Coalition. That's our nonprofit. We started, we're a group of six moms, working moms. We started after the flood. We kind of found each other after the flood, and, and that's how we started. Um, and after three weeks of running the medical area in that shelter, you know, we had commendations from the governor's office and from the federal government. Um, thank you so much for your service during that time. So it's even the government is recognizing that there's a need for this. Mm-hmm. And um, so the year after the flood, uh, 2017 is when Hurricane Harvey hit Houston. And that was about a mm-hmm. month before yeah. Hurricane Maria. Um, and there's a Facebook group, Physician Moms Group. It's about 80,000 physician moms that are in this group. And um, Dr. Jennifer McQuaid, who's in the Houston area, had posted something after after Harvey, you know, we really need help. I'm I'm in the shelter. I'm overwhelmed. And I sent her a message. She ended up calling me and I said, you have to take over. You have to start this Mm -hmm. medical area. And she's and she said, no, I'm an oncologist. (laughs) And I said, it doesn't matter. (laughs) You just have to do it. Um, and so she did and, um, and I helped to guide her, but that's when we started using planes for the first time. And so realizing there are all these private pilots that just love to fly, right? That's their hobby. They love to fly. And these people are incredibly generous people. If they're going to be doing their hobby anyway, then how can we help you? Okay, you know, let's load up your plane. And that's what we did. And then, and then that kind of trickled into Hurricane Maria. Um, And, you know, I don't, I'm not a pilot, I don't know. So I'm just thinking like, oh, well, can our pilots go to Puerto Rico? And it's like, no, Ashley, you need you know, an open ocean license and all, you know, you need a jet, you can't just use, you know, prop play. And I'm like, oh, yeah. well, okay. <laughs> um, but through a, a series, a series of miraculous events, um, a nurse at our hospital knew um, some of the people at Dow, Dow Chemical, um, and their hangar is here in Baton Rouge. And so, um, one their first flight from Baton Rouge to Puerto Rico, they were going to get some employees in Puerto Rico. Um, she was able to secure space for 
our group on the plane to send supplies. And we had already connected with the family medicine, um, the family medicine uh, group in Puerto Rico. That's kind of like the American Academy of Pediatrics, but it was um, Academy of Family Medicine in Puerto Rico. So they were going to receive the plane. And so we had the first private plane of supplies into Puerto Rico. And it's kind of still just, mind blowing that that happened. And then, you know, I, again, it was miraculous. These jets kept popping up, you know, well, we're yeah. going, do you want to load our plane? Like, yeah. Okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's because you already had that blueprint, right. And for you to then be able to assist, you know, um, you know, during the Harvey situation and then also be able to assist. It was kind of like, oh, here we go again, unfortunately. Right. But what right. a blessing that you had already gone through that. So you already knew, you know, wh wh which how to pivot, what to do, what the needs were probably going to be, the primary needs and all of that. And so right. I just want to say thank you because oh, just... Oh. Working with My you pleasure. during those months was like, we could breathe, right? Just to know that there was someone that understood, A, that understood what the crisis was all about and what that looks like, because you had experienced a flooding, right? I'm in Baton right. Rouge. And then to understand also, right, that what, what, that the crisis could become an even worse crisis. And it, and, and it did, right, in some parts, because People just didn't. didn't get there. It was so catastrophic that it was just really bad. But it could have been so much worse if it wasn't for people like you and just getting those, all of that stuff, especially the medical supplies, right, to the island as soon right. as possible. And, and that was such a, uh, such a group effort. And so it went from, um, you know, our group, our nonprofit, to... Um, all of these physicians that connected after um, really after Harvey yeah. and then their network and seeing like, Oh my gosh, you can do these simple things or these little things. And it makes a huge impact for so mm -hmm. many. Um, and so then we have, we still have a, a Facebook message group called physician 18. Um, it's kind of funny, but uh, it's a group of, of female physicians who connected through Hurricane Maria. And I mean, we had, you know, Nora Gonzalez is out of Miami. She was on the phone with a um, water uh, nonprofit, clean water um, organization and had systems out in the major provinces in Puerto Rico within a few months or a few weeks, sorry. And then another one of our members, um, I think it was Kim, you may be out of California, was uh, on the phone with a solar energy, like trying to get solar panels out in Puerto Rico to get people mm -hmm. power, you know, especially people that were, um, that have, that need technology, right? So they're mm -hmm. technology yes. dependent, like people yeah. on ventilators, straight in yeah. um, ventilators. So it's just incredible to see people step up and, and do these incredible things, um, out, just out of the goodness of their heart. And, you know, we didn't, like you said, we didn't know each other, but I feel like the, the friends that I made from that experience are like, I feel like I'm Puerto Rican. I'm like honorary uh, Puerto Yes, Rican. you are. You are. Absolutely. Uh, yes, yes, but totally. It, it, yeah, it's just been, um, it, it really was a, a blessing. And I mean, I hate that we had to meet like we That's did, right. um, yeah. but yeah. But it, it it was all it was it was amazing, and I love the aspect of how everyone was just on this mission. It was humanity driven, you know. It was driven by women mainly, too, right? Calling their shots. The the men right. assisted and supported, but it was moms, right? It was like this fierce. It was amazing, right? camaraderie and like this strong contingency nationwide of just women physicians of all backgrounds just coming together to get the job done basically it was just it was just epic the whole thing yes. and so then you know after everything was kind of sort of under control and everybody went back into their you know into their and into their own lives this was pre-zoom Right. So then the, the pandemic happened, all of that. And so here we are 
And I don't know, you reached out to me yeah. and I was like, oh my goodness, Ashley, this is so cool uh, to, you know, and so then I am I was so excited just to learn, you know, about what's, what passions are driving you. I mean, where hurricane season is right around the corner though. So, I mean, I'm sure that's always at this time of the year. I mean, is it something that kind of haunts you or worries you every time that hurricane season's right around the corner? Um, it's inevitable, right? Um, so it's just kind of like my spidey senses are always heightened. Um, and when the need arises, um, I think it's, it's all of these connections that we've made. And so, um, when, when these things pop up, somebody may contact me or I might get tagged in a post, um, or I might see something and reach out and then then it just kind of spirals from there and so i i i let those things happen um Mm -hmm. and that i've found that that's the best way to be impactful is um to just kind of follow the trail yeah Um, but yeah i mean unfortunately it seems like every year it's just a little bit worse a little bit worse every year with the hurricanes Yes, yes, totally. And it's all about climate change too, right? And it's like you say, you know, um, but in, in, in that, right, as a pediatric emergency medicine uh, doctor, um, you're also very much about empowering kids uh, to be curious, to really explore, you know, their surroundings and to understand because uh, you are, as, as a doctor, doctors are scientists, too right uh we yes before <laughs> and so you're about you know um promoting and fostering uh nurturing that curiosity in kids because I, this is the conversation we had last week that you said that kids are born scientists right and so that's right some yeah sometimes we we think that it's either complicated or it could be costly to um you know uh how do you say nurture you know the this uh, uh scientist uh, persona or in um inclinations that kids have and so i figured it would be great to have this conversation with you about how can we how can we uh, make kids love the environment become more in tune with you know the world around us understand better understand right the cause and effect right? Of our behaviors and how they impact us, right? How it's like that, you know, boomerang effect, right? We got to be careful with that. And then how to um, explore solutions. How how do we do that? Yeah, I think um, it's such a great topic. I mean, it really is. Um, So I am no longer um, with my, my previous hospital. And that was a blessing because it's allowed me to take a deeper dive into this, you know, into um, kids and learning and um, helping families like busy working families or families that are on really tight budgets. Like how can they do this with their kids Mm -hmm. um, in a way that brings everybody together? Um, And even if it's for five minutes, you know, but they have fun, they maybe get a little messy, the kids learn and the parents learn. Um, and so at, when we spoke, I, I told you uh, when I was pregnant with my now 10 year old, we had seen a video. Uh, my husband and I had seen a video. He's also a scientist. He's a geologist and an engineer and does a lot of coastal restoration, climate change work. So this is a topic that comes up again and again in our house. Um but Neil deGrasse Tyson said, we're big fans, said um, kids are born scientists and that's what they're doing as they grow up, right? From the, from the um, crawling stage, the cruising stage, into walking, into, you know, toddlers. It's not terrible twos. It's not. They're exploring. They're trying to figure out their world. Um, and so we really kept that in mind and tried to foster that with our kids. So they each, um, for each of the kids, and our boys are two years apart, um, we had cabinets in the kitchen that were kind of they, their cabinets. You know, they couldn't go 
um, into the cabinet under the sink, right? There's some cleaning stuff there, but they could go into all of these other cabinets and bang on pots and pull out uh, plastic water bottles, or I know I shouldn't say plastic water bottles. Like we don't have as many plastic water bottles now, but at the time, this is before all the fancy like metal water bottles, right? Um, But like Neil deGrasse Tyson says, you know, a, a kid, a little one with a pot and a wooden spoon who's banging on that pot Yes, it's loud. And yes, it can be after you've had a long day of work and you're just, you've got to stop doing that. But it's a lesson in acoustics for Mm -hmm. that child. You know, Mm -hmm. what happens if I bang on the big pot? What happens if I bang on the small pot? Mm -hmm. What happens if I use a, a metal spoon or a wooden spoon? You know, how these things change. And so it's very hard as working parents, as tired parents, right? To say, yes, go for it. Do this thing, right? Um, Because we really, sometimes we just need order in our houses and we need it to be quiet and we just need a minute. Um, And so how do you balance those two things? And it's really hard to do, but I think it's definitely something that we can do. Um, And so from the time our boys were little, we were always, and I was like this as a kid, I wanted to mix things. You know, what happens if I mix dirt and water? What happens if I put more dirt? What happens if I put more water? And then we've just kind of built on that, you know, the uh, from the simple baking soda and vinegar kind of, you know, volcano uh, to the more complex experiments, you know, it's it's doable. And now with YouTube, they're... I don't even, gosh, thousands of YouTubers who do these elaborate things. And it's great to give you an idea, you know, how can we think about doing these things? But um, really, that's what I've been looking at in the last month is like, how can we do some of these things for working parents um, to say, hey, look, all you need are these three simple things. It's going to cost you $15 and your kids are going to have a blast for, you know, an hour. Right, right. Totally. Well, the dirt and the water, that's actually, I mean, technically free, right? <laughs> because you just have to go Absolutely. outside. Yeah. Absolutely. But that is, that is really, really great. And so, and, and I think that that's um, something that we're always concerned about, right, is the mess and how annoying the noise can be and all of that stuff. But I didn't make that connection until you mentioned it about how it is an experiment, right? Because how sound bounces off, you know, or two things, you know, going against each other and producing a sound sounds so differently because of the weight or the composition, right? Or the materials that they're made of and all of that. And that is uh, scientific exactly. exploration. Yeah. That's great. And so then why, I mean, I know that, I know that, um, you know, working for an institution must, must be, you know, a little bit restrictive in terms of, you know, all of this creativity. Do you feel that, you know, are you wearing like this entrepreneurship hat sort of, you know, and going really taking a deep dive into taking all of this, um, expertise and all of these, um, um, experiences that you've amassed, right, throughout the years um, that combine, right, crisis intervention and dealing with kids also, because I'm sure that these kinds of experiments and this um, uh, nurturing of discovery also t- helps with trauma and with um, refocusing and making sure that people right. have an outlet, right, to connect with right. others and express themselves. So, you know, how how did you land on on doing this now moving forward. Yeah. So, um, so the end of March, um, so, and this, this is something I'm very comfortable talking about. Um, and I, I think it needs to be, um, discussed is, uh, hospitals. If, if you're in a state that's an at will state, they can terminate your contract at any time. And hospitals, um, many hospitals don't have physician-friendly contracts. And so at the end of March, I was terminated without cause. So meaning there was, it was nothing that I did. The hospital wanted to go in a different direction. And, you know, I would have never left my team. It was a team Mm -hmm. that I built. I would have never, 
left them, but I had really been thinking about leaving um, mm-hmm. in the months preceding that, but I couldn't do it. I, I kind of say I didn't have the guts mm-hmm. to do it. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't want to leave them. And so that uh, decision was made for me and it was the greatest gift I could have been given mm-hmm. because it, it opened my mind to, you know, now I'm not stuck in the grind. Now mm-hmm. I can like, what are the things that I've wanted to do? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think my, one of my superpowers is that I communicate so well with kids and I joke, this is why I coach my little one soccer team, because I don't know anything about soccer, but I know what they've taught me, <laughs> um, but I can get kids to do anything I want them to. And so if I'm like, <laughs> we're going to run 10 laps. They're like, okay. You know? um, and I think that that's the case because I, uh, you know, for, for a lot of adults, kids are kind of in the background, but for me, they're very much present and they're in every situation. And I talk to them like they're people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they respond so well to that. And when you talk to kids like they're people, Like they're little creatures who are crazy (laughs) smart, right? They're, they're so smart. Um, And they're smart. It's just amazing to see how their little minds work. Uh, But when you do that, it's really incredible and can open up some amazing conversations. And so even with my boys, I realized that we can have some very candid conversations about some topics that may be difficult, right? Um, Mm -hmm. About death, about illnesses, about how the human body works. And so my kids um, know a whole lot about the human body. Um, And, and so, and that was kind of in the, well, let's get fun and messy with science, but then also let's, now that we've done that, let's kind of think about how these chemical reactions happen within the body. And so Mm -hmm. then fostering that kids as little scientists. And for some kids, you know, sometimes they just do need to just get messy and that's okay. And then (laughs) other kids want to ask the questions. Like, I don't understand how this works or why did this work like this? Or, oh, I did it wrong. This is my favorite. When they say, oh, I did it wrong. I didn't Put, and that's the great thing about science is there's not a wrong, right? Because that's how we've discovered some really amazing things mm-hmm. is people have made mistakes. And mm-hmm. from the mistakes have come incredible discoveries. And so even the other day we were doing a, our little lava lamps that we like to do. And my son put the food coloring in a different way. And it created this beautiful... Thing. And my other son and I were like, whoa, we never even thought about doing it like that. And it was a total accident. You know, he just did the yeah. steps in a different way and, and it made this great thing. And when I teach science, um, you know, when I teach science to, to kids, if we're doing an experiment and it doesn't work, I always say, great, because if it works 100 percent of the time, then what are we learning? Right? Like, right. We have to make these mistakes. We have to pivot. We have to figure out a way that it's going to work and then translating that into life lessons, right? Like mm-hmm. things aren't going to always go the way you want them to. And so how can you take what's going on around you, pivot and keep going? Yeah, absolutely. Which is how you were able to create that blueprint for crises in hurricanes or flooding, right? Because, and it's all right. part of the same. And I just feel that um, so many times we restrict, right? The, we, we have our own red tape within our families, right? And in our homes that, yes. no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. Or this is the only way you can do this, right? And so right. Um, this, this is a really a, a, a very um, refreshing a perspective uh, to, yeah, to incorporating, you know, exploration at home because these kids are there, they're the ones that are going to hopefully save us, right? From Yes, our- <laughs> absolutely. And, and like before any parents maybe, you know, listen to this and are like, this lady is no, like no way. I also do, I'm 
very clear with my kids, scientists, like you got to keep a clean workspace. Yeah. So it's clean before we start. It's clean when we're done. You know, we're, we're working together to clean it up, but also in doing this, you know, how can we do some of these experiments in a more sustainable way? Yeah. Um, talking about environmental effects and, you know, just ugh, plastic, um, and those kind of things. So, um, so those are some other things we've started, the kids and I have started to think about it. Like, how can we tweak these projects that we're not using um, a ton of plastic bags? Or if we do have to use plastic bags, how can we then repurpose those plastic bags into something that's not just going in the trash? Right. Um, and we do, we, we talk um, quite a bit about um, you know, global warming, but climate change in general and what that means. Uh, my kids really get a kick of, out of, um, so I went plant, mostly plant-based almost three years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and part, part for my health, but part for the environment and, you know, it's almost three years ago. So at the time they were like, uh, four and six or, somewhere around there and mom, what do you mean for the environment? And, you know, well, guys, like all of these cow farts, it's really bad for the environment. And they just got, like got the biggest <laughs> kick out of that. Like what? And so, but then we take a deep dive and, and look yeah. at that and what's really happening. And just these yeah. things you, you maybe never even think about, um, yeah. but they're so curious and they want to know. And then it forces me to mm -hmm. learn even more about it. Yeah, that's great. And so then again, this is really all of these resources or at least these ideas, right, are available right here. This is, you know, just a quick, right, search yeah. you know, for simple and I, 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 things. Yeah. And that's um part of, I think, what the boys and I are going to do this summer Yeah, is just consolidate it for parents because you're, there's so, I mean, there's so much, so many and by age everywhere. Group, I think that what's more daunting is just to go through all the possibilities and then vet them, right? Like vet mm -hmm. what really works, what doesn't work, what's safe, what age group also, you know, and to have that lens, your lens from a pediatric emergency physicians lens, right? Because we don't want to burn the down the house down. That's for sure. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you know, just certain things that we might use that um, you know, I wouldn't want a little one to use because I don't want them sticking their hand in it and then rubbing their eye. Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's great. So you're looking to formulate this into a more um formal offering soon? Yes. Yes. Hey, um, that's okay. where I, I hope we'll be working more together on this. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That that's really great. I mean, I'm I'm so happy, you know, um, for you that you've been able to, you know, not only support and, and for everybody that, you know, is in your network and that knows about your experience and about your um, know-how on how to uh, quickly, um, how do you say, stop the hemorrhaging in terms of a crisis and, and know where to uh, target, what to target first from a medical standpoint, uh, but then also that you're afforded now this time, right? And in your life to be able to explore entrepreneurship, put into practice all of these things you learn to really build capacity among children and youth yes. and, help par and help parents empower their kids too, to be problem solvers themselves, no? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And just, um, you know, that's the the biggest message, I think, and something that I'll reference Neil deGrasse Tyson again. He says, you know, before you just fuss at them, just for a minute, just think, wait, why are they doing it? Why do I think they're doing this, right? Are they, are they doing it just to make a lot of noise and aggravate mm -hmm. me? Or are they really trying to figure this out? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think in, in, in the end, when we approach it from that way, we enjoy our kids more. 
I think we have a lot more fun. Um, and then, like I said, we learn, you know, mm-hmm. I, I've learned so much from them. Yeah, that's great. Well, listen, thank you so much. I know, you know, that you're, you know, very, very busy and that you're very involved in the community and you have no idea how much I appreciate you. And I'm oh so gosh, thankful thank you. that our paths crossed again. I know. LinkedIn. <laughs> And clearly under stable circumstances. Let's just war. Yes. I'm just not even going to. Yes, we're going to war off all of those, you know, <laughs> bad jujus out there and all of that. I we know. Don't want any more, any more flooding or hurricanes, right? And so. I know. Um, I know. This, <laughs> this is this is fantastic that we reconnect. And I very much look forward to learning more about what you're putting together to really Thank help us you. foster li- many, many scientists, right? In every single Yes. Family. Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of I Have Something to Say, where subject matter experts are unafraid and unapologetic about sharing their perspectives regarding issues that impact our lives. They speak up because basically they give a shit. So if you're tired of canned answers and want to finally hear real people cut through the BS and talk about real issues, this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Sami Heyman Marrero from Urbander, and behind our mixer is our producer, Chris Mayoka from You Do You.